Hey guys, this is Daniel and welcome back to another video. Today I'm actually back in Blender because I want to show you something that many people are struggling with and it's a bit confusing. And I personally don't know 100% of this topic myself, so I can just give you my opinion and my knowledge. But I think it's worth sharing, so uh, let me talk to you about color management today. As you can see here in Blender, there is a bunch of settings, like you can set display device settings, you can set the render settings, and if you load a texture, uh, over here, then once you load it, um, do you have anything? I don't really have a picture right now available, but anyways, uh, you will get once again color settings, sRGB, linear, and that kind of thing. So I want to switch now to Photoshop quickly and make some sketches that hopefully help you understand the concepts of color management. So let me go ahead here. I'll just quickly take my brush. And so what I want to tell you today is why we have why we have this sRGB linear thing and so on very quickly. So here is a graph and I'll quickly tell you what these what the graph should tell you. On the y axis I will be showing what the human sees, human perception. Human perception this is what we see, how bright something is. And this here is uh, the data. So let's start with what we know, what we're very comfortable with and what we've probably worked a lot with already. That is that in an 8-bit data format, when we save a picture with 8-bit, with you have a range between 0 and 255 to work with. I assume you know the concept of why it is that way. Anyways, in digitals, in our digital system, we can say that this is our brightest value and this here is our darkest value, black. Now, on this axis, we'll do the same for a human. Of course, there can always be a brighter um, light, but we'll just say that here is some value that we consider to be white as humans. And this is, of course, black, because black is kind of an absolute absence of light. We can just consider it to be kind of the same. But now what happens in between? Now you would say that, okay, if this is white, if this is white, and this is white, so what's the big deal? And we know that black and black are the same as well. So why can't we just connect these two, these two points? And we get all the other values, right? So for example, if you want to, to see half the half the brightness why don't we just go half half the way down on this graph and we get our value which is well half of 255 uh, something along the lines of 128 but unfortunately it turns out that it is not that easy um it turns out that humans the human eye compresses everything that's really bright into um less variation and gets more ha has more sensitivity in the dark areas. This is for the simple reason that we humans don't really need to be able to tell the difference between the sun and the sky, which are both really bright, but we really do need to, to tell the difference maybe if we walk in a dark street and there is a, I don't know what, there's some obstacle in our way. There is only little difference in the presence of light, but we need to be able to tell those kind of things apart. So our human eye is really good at seeing dark things, but not that great at seeing differences in the brightness, bright areas. So just to give you an example, this is not accurate, but just as an example, if we have something that is, let's say like 5% bright on this scale, this is just a scale that we make up here, and we change it to 10%, it's not much of a difference, but we can see a very visible difference in this little space. However, if we take the same amount of percent difference, for example, we, we take 85% and we go to 90%, many people will not be able to tell a difference at all. Maybe you'll be able to tell a little bit of a difference, but this one here will look like it's a big difference, whereas this one is a little difference. So what do we have to do now if we want if we want a uh, 50% gray. 
for 50% gray, we now have to <clears throat> actually have very, very less light because if we, for example, draw the point here, the difference between here and here, it is a big difference in the presence of light. But we said that in the bright area, we don't see much of a difference. So this one appears to be the same amount of difference than between the black and this gray. So that means that this here will be our 50% gray point. And we can continue that and try to find then again the half of that, so 25%. We can try to find where 75%. And it turns out that for our human perception, this curve will turn out to look um, something along the lines of this here. I'll just try to make this work somehow. Should be a curve like this. So that's what we, we humans see if we want to always make, um, like, cut the brightness in half, so to speak. But in the, in the digital work world, we need to save our data as numbers. So how do we deal with this situation? If we say we just save the brightness as is, so more brightness means more power to the screen, so we get more light. Now, see what would happen. We, we have now, um, so how can I do this? Let me quickly copy this, this layer so that I can erase a little bit on it. So we have to go back to our previous, previous uh, line. So this is what we would get if we directly just take the brightness of a value. For example, we want it to be white, so we send the white. And it would turn out white. And and then now we want to have a grayish color. So gray, we said, is supposed to be here. So instead now of sending a 128 value to achieve a gray, we actually have to send now, um, well, something around here. Let's say this is 35 or, I don't know, maybe it's 40. Anyways, we send a value that's around here and there's no problem, right? We see the gray that we wanted to see because um, it's over here. But now here's an issue. This is only 50% gray. There is still so much more that we can see and so much more sensitivity that our eye has available for this whole area between 50 and 0. So... But now look at the data that we can save. We only have another 40 steps left between 0 and 40. So if we save it in this linear way, uh, we end up having too few steps available. So if I, if I draw a gradient for you that simulates having not enough steps, uh, we could end up with something like this. A gradient that looks like here with very, very visible steps. It doesn't look smooth at all because the data points that we save are big steps in our sensitivity. On the other hand, we have how much? Ha 210 more available data points in this whole bright area where actually we only have, you know, half of our visible perception. So that doesn't make much sense, of course. So instead of this, of this linear curve, we now tend to um, save our data sort of distorted. This is the, what I'm trying to tell you here basically is why we have this sRGB color space. Because now we save our data, um, we save for example 128, but really what we display, oh actually Actually, this is a bit uh, wrong here. Anyways, but the, the graph might be a bit wrong here, but um, we save a 128 value and we see something that's 50% gray. All right, and, and that is now thanks to that curve that we apply in it. So then we have a, an even, even spread of 
data in the dark areas and an even amount of steps in the bright areas. So when we make a gradient, basically there will be no, there will be an even distribution of the color to our perception. Okay, now um, everything sounds good so far, right? We have solved that problem. However, there is a problem with that, <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it. What happens now if we want to edit our video? Let's say uh, we go into some editing tool and we want to add color to it if we want to change something. We cannot just go ahead and add color here because we might add something and mm, in the dark area it makes a huge change. In the bright area there's almost no change. Um, so what we have to do in order to do these kind of mathematical operations on our color is to first convert this into a linear space and then we can do the math because then you know doubling it is actual doubling it and then we have to go back to our our previous one that's like the sRGB space which which is for the human perception and deals good with the colors and so we get calculations in between and we have to do this for every single step in our editing process and although we can avoid loss of quality because we can work with float values and so that means we can for a moment simulate to have like many many thousand steps and so we don't get the problem of, of stretching our image in a bad way however we still um, it's, it's on the one hand it just might be inefficient or it might be more importantly, when you actually switch the software, when you when you really save this kind of transformed uh, transformed colors into a file, you might not be able to get those informations back. But you just have to be aware in in what sort of um, color space you are in currently and work in that. Now, this is really good for all of our end products because we want to show the picture in a way that that is well visible for the human or we want to save a lot of information in the dark areas so we apply these kind of curves to it. However when we now do editing uh, we might not want to have that because then we can easier do our calculations. So the strategy is that you might have captured something in in an sRGB space, but you might want to, as a first step, get out of that sRGB space, get into linear space, do all the editing, and then go back at the end. Uh, that is one way. Another point where the linear space becomes interesting is that when you use it for textures. For example, a hate map. You have, for example, a picture that has white parts, and then you have also black parts, and the way a 3D tool would interpret this is you map this picture onto a plane. So here is the white area, here is the dark area. And everything that's white will be distorted, everything that's black will be distorted in the other way. And you could get something that looks like this. So it is a tool for distorting your, your, your meshes according to, to an image. But but if you have now the whole thing in a, let's say you just have a gray, um, a gradient that's linear. You want to have it as str to be straight, but what if you have it in a color profile, it will end up looking like distorted. Even worse, if you wanted to do mountains and you have a heat map of mountains, and then it turns out that it was in an sRGB color profile, the mountains might look really weirdly round like this, and that's really not what you want. So you have to be careful in this case, uh, what color profile your pictures are in. So to demonstrate that quickly, I will create a new file. Uh, let me just do the resolution. We don't need that much actually. We don't have that many color steps anyway, so and not color managed picture with 256 by 256 pixels. I'll go ahead and make a gradient. In here I'll make sure that the gradient that I'm making uh, has zero smoothness. That's really important. Um, let's see if the settings are good. 
So 0% smoothness, we don't want any steps in between. And now we should be able to get a linear, uh, linear gradient. And the reason why the gray in the middle might look actually gray to you is because although the data is not color managed, Photoshop knows that the display is sRGB. And so, uh, although if we measure, we get 50% gray in the middle, the screen actually um, displays it appropriately. However, when we save that, uh, let's save that quickly. I'll put it on my desktop as a gradient. I save it as a PNG. And now I go back to Blender and I will open this in, in the UV editor. See what we get. It looks fine for now. But what if we change to linear? In linear space, which it is, it shows us now the color uh, as it is saved. And now we get like little bit of difference in the darks and like a lot of difference in the whites. This might look strange to us. However, if we apply this to, to um, a displacement modifier, as I previously suggested, what we could do, um, I'll go to the modifiers, add a displacement modifier, create a texture for it, map it on our UVs, and add the picture here. You see, we have a clean, straight picture, thanks to us interpreting it in a linear way. If this picture was interpreted as an as an as RGB image, the result would look different. Uh, I don't think there is actually a way to make it make Blender take it differently. Um, I tried changing the settings here, but Blender always interprets it in a linear way, so we don't have a problem. But there is, for example, a way to paint a gradient in Blender. If I go to Fill and I take a gradient. And this is supposed to be a linear gradient, but it is a, a linear gradient for an sRGB space. So if we put this down and we look now at the updated mesh, you see that the mesh has a curve to it. This is because the distribution of colors was interpreted in the wrong way. So there you have it. It was complicated, but I hope you get the point of why, why sRGB exists in first place but why we still need to make use of linear color spaces in editing, how it can be important for textures, how we might want to use it in the whole editing process of our pipeline, but how we want in the end when exporting the video to make sure that, again, we save it in something that's relatable for humans, like sRGB. Just think of it, think about it, let it go through your head. Um, and what else can I say? That's pretty much it. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a good time and hopefully I'll be back with more videos.